Dharma Talkers, season's greetings, and Happy New Year. I hope your holidays, assuming you celebrate something, it seems like most people do this time of year. I hope your holidays have brought you more peace than stress. And that if that hasn't been the case, that you're finding time to recuperate. Give yourself some me time, you know? Speaking of which, how would you like to set aside 40 minutes a day over the next 40 days just for yourself to attend to your mind, body, and spirit with consistency on your own schedule from your own home? How does that sound? Well then, get yourself the Henry Yoga app. This is my program of Hatha Vinyasa classes and skill building workshops to take you deeper into your practice. And it makes the perfect self-care gift or tool for a New Year's transformation. Get the first two classes for free at henryyoga.com. All right, Dharma Talkers, today's episode is gonna be a little bit different. We're on the precipice of some notable milestones. It's the end of a decade. It's the start of a new one. And since I started this podcast, I've now interviewed nearly 100 yogis. We're coming up on the 100 interview or episode mark. And also nearly 100,000 downloads right on the edge of that milestone as well. When I launched this podcast in March of 2018, Honestly, I didn't know what would come of it. I didn't know it would last this long. Not that I thought it would end, but I really didn't know what to predict. And I've learned not to try to look too far into the future, just to focus on what's happening here and now. And now that I look back on it, in hindsight, I can reflect on all of the wonderful things that's come of this show, of this project. I've personally benefited quite a lot from hosting Dharma Talk. I've met all these new people. I've shared the mic with amazing yoga teachers I truly admire. Um, And you know, in the beginning, I was just interviewing my friends. I was interviewing yoga teachers that I knew and I was already connected with. But now at this point, I'm, I'm being connected through the podcast to people who I once looked up to and I still look up to, but it was a different kind of, um, different kind of level like I never thought that I could be able to be in a position to be having a one-on-one conversation with these people and and now the podcast has given me this platform to to learn and grow from them and and for that alone I'm I'm so grateful but on top of all of that I've also connected with listeners in almost 300 countries and I'm also learning about building something bigger than myself that has been a big lesson for me this year um, to learn how to not not have to control every single aspect of what's going on in my world. Yoga has taught me that, of course, but sometimes it's got to be outside of the yoga mat for you to really take in that lesson. And yoga maybe prepares you for that, to be more receptive. But this year has been one where I've delegated and trusted in other people's help. And because of that, Maybe you notice the podcast quality has bumped up. I hired Rory, who has been instrumental and integral in taking Dharma Talk to the next level. And I'm seeing that as a lesson that I can pull through in other aspects of my life as well. So for today's show, because of all these milestones and to kind of celebrate the new year, I wanted to try something a little different. And that's why I sourced your questions for Dharma Talk. So let me know what you think about this format for the show. If it works, if this format works, then maybe we'll try it again and do a second installment in the series. Let me know by um, sending me a message. Uh, You can email henry at henrywins.com or you can send me a message at henrywins on Instagram. Also, as always, I love it when you take screenshots of of your podcast player and post that on Instagram. Uh, It helps to spread the word, and I like to see what sort of things are really resonating with you because it helps me direct the show into the future. Other ways that you can support the show, apart from sharing it with friends, sharing it on your social media. First of all, 
Subscribe if you haven't already. Please subscribe so that you get the new episode every Thursday. Secondly, leave a rating and review on iTunes, Apple Podcasts. And third, the one that helps the most, to be quite candid, is to make a donation. The show is costly to produce, and I love doing it. I want to keep doing it. And if you would like for me to keep doing it, please consider making a recurring monthly donation, which can be done at henrywins.com slash donate. Now let me take this opportunity to thank my gracious sponsor. This episode is brought to you in part by Yoga East Austin. The last two weeks, you may have heard me mention how excited I am about a three-day immersion with Benjamin Sears happening down in my old yoga spot in Austin, Texas. My friends at Yoga East Austin recently started tagging these types of events as, quote, higher education, simply because they are presented by masterful and incredible teachers, usually with at least a decade of teaching experience. What I admire most about these events is that the entire teaching staff at Yoga East Austin jumps in, eager to learn and lead their students by example, which in turn creates an environment that elevates continued yoga education to the highest priority. Teachers out there listening, we all learn from somebody, right? Each of these higher education events represents the culmination of learning from traditional and modern yogis alike. Teachings that have been passed down from years of practice with legendary teachers, integrated with experimentation and cross-pollination from the ever-evolving modern yoga landscape. The next continued education event for teachers and students of all levels will be offered by my good friend and previous Dharma Talk guest, Benjamin Sears, the founder of Lux Yoga and creator of the Sacred Geometry Vinyasa Yoga System. Ben has been studying and teaching for 13 plus years from far too many yogis to list out now, but also from modern and popular breath and movement modalities, such as Katona Yoga, Functional Range Conditioning, and the Ido Portal and Wim Hof Methods. This three-day intensive on February 7th through 9th will include everything from pranayama and meditation to functional mobility and asana. Plus, I know Tatiana will be there assisting Ben, and she is an incredible mover and yogini with a decade of teaching experience unto herself. Added bonus, East Austin is an amazing place to visit and eat. Whether you're into the best barbecue or a mindful vegan, East Austin offers something for everyone. Yoga East Austin is also conveniently located in a neighborhood with plenty of Airbnbs and restaurants and stores all within walking distance of the yoga studio. So if you want to learn about your body from someone that has a wealth of knowledge moving pain-free in an excellent city location, I might add, this training immersion is for you. Check out yogaeastaustin.com slash Benjamin for more info on this three-day weekend event happening February 7th through 9th in Austin, Texas. Do not miss out. And use promo code HENRYWINS at checkout to save 15%. And one more quick announcement for my European listeners. Veronica and I are coming through mini tour in January, and I'd love to see you if you're in the area On January 10th through 12th, we're going to Yoga Garage in Florence. January 17th through 19th, we're going to Studio Giotier in Milan. And January 24th through 26th, we're going to Anahata Yoga Studio in Thessaloniki, Greece. And finally, January 31st through February 2nd, we're going to Hara Yoga Studio in Barcelona, Spain. So to get the details for all of those events, head over to henrywins.com slash events and you can sign up there. All right, now back to the show. As I mentioned before, this is going to be a Q&A format episode. I am so appreciative of all of you who sent in questions. So thank you if you submitted a question through Instagram or the Google form. Know that I can't answer all of the questions that came through, but I did read every single one, and I really appreciate your input and care that put into the thoughtful questions. So without further ado, let's dive in. My first question comes from Instagram. I'm not sure how to pronounce this handle. It looks like at Kale SHS. The question is, what is Dharma? How do we identify 
the right dharma? Well, this is a great question to kick things off. And it's quite similar to the question that I ask all of my guests. So I've had a lot of time and a lot of opportunity to reflect on this question. And I think it makes, you may not be surprised to learn that this question has been top of mind for me for a long time. Hence the reason why I themed the podcast around Dharma and asked that question to all these people that I admire. So this is a question that I think about a lot and it's definitely a rich and deep question that only opens up more questioning the more you go into it. But I'll give you my take on it. And first, I'll just say that because it's such a deep and rich concept with plenty of room for interpretation, my answer will be just that, my interpretation. Something that's been really helpful to me in thinking about Dharma, a concept that's really resonated with me, is the Japanese concept of Ikigai, I-K-I-G-A-I in Roman letters. And this is a concept that I learned about from watching a documentary about the Blue Zones. I think it's on Netflix or one of the online content providers, I forget which one, but the blue zones are these areas in planet earth where people tend to live to be at least a hundred years old. And the segment on this culture in Japan of people who are living to be a hundred years old or longer attributes the longevity of the life cycle there, the life expectancy to having purpose and their idea behind purpose much like Dharma, is complex. Ikigai is a model for understanding a purpose that will sustain you and give you a will to live, essentially. And it comes up, it arises from four components that must overlap. So you can think of it like a four-circle diagram or a four-circle Venn diagram, and your ikigai, or your dharma, as the case may be, lies right in the middle in that intersect between the four circles. The first circle is what do you love to do? So what is it that feeds your passion, gets you excited, you wake up and you're ready to do this thing? The second circle is what are you good at? So what do you excel at? What do you have a skill in that's exceptional? doesn't mean that you need to be the best in the world, but you should be above average and people should recognize you for that. Like you should know in yourself that you're skilled at whatever this pursuit is and other people should be able to tell too and think of you when they think of that skill. The next circle is what is something that the other people around you need. So the first two circles are more about you and what it is that drives you. The next two circles are about what the other people need and how they respond to your contribution. So what does the world need? What is an unmet need that you are uniquely qualified to fulfill? And maybe not uniquely like you're the only person, but it's somewhat rare. Like that's something that's characteristic of you that you can contribute to fulfilling this unmet need. And then the fourth circle is what can you be paid for? What are people willing to part with their money in order for you to provide this type of service? And I think this last part um, is where some people start to raise an eyebrow because Dharma is like the spiritual concept, right? And why should money be attached to that? Well, let me challenge that frame of mind because first of all, how many of us can say that we are truly living a renunciate lifestyle? Now that's one thing if you're a monk and you live in a monastery and you don't need money, but most of us are householders. So if you want to live and survive in a capitalist society that works on an exchange based on currency, then you need to be okay with receiving money. But the deeper kind of idea, the deeper concept beneath all of this transcends the currency. And that's that it needs to be something, your dharma, your ikigai, your pursuit that meets all of these conditions, needs to be something that people see value in. And that's what being paid for really represents. If, you're, if someone is willing to pay you for this act, that means they value it. So to recap that really quick, 
you love it, you're good at it, you're able to contribute to other people doing this act, and other people value it. So that concept of ikigai, if you can cross all four of those boxes, those check boxes off, or find the overlap in that four circle Venn diagram, then I think you're well on your way to being on the right dharma. Now, all of that being said, what I will caveat on the topic of dharma in my understanding, my belief, is here's where it diverges from ikigai. Ikigai is very practical and it tells you like this is a career path that you can take or this is like a way of spending your time that you can do that will lead to success and give you a sense of purpose. For me, dharma is not so much of a static destin destination so much as the entire evolution, the journey to get there. So whether you feel that you've crossed all those boxes off doesn't really mean that you're not living your dharma. Your dharma may be the path that's leading you there and all these lessons that you're learning along the way. For example, to tie it to my own personal history, if I were to be very strict about following the ikigai to qualify what I'm doing, then when I was working in pharmaceutical advertising, well, then I certainly was not living my dharma. And while I think it's true that I was not in Ikigai, I do think that I was in my Dharma because had it not been for that experience, had I not been pushed to my own limits and been in a really deep place of mental struggle and stress and, and inner reflection about what it is that mattered to me, then I might not have been rerouted onto the path that I'm on now. And it would be arrogant of me to think that where I am now is the final destination. Even though I do think that my work is aligned to my values in a much better way than it was before, I know that I will continue to evolve. I'm still, you know, in the first half of my life, hopefully, and I don't pretend to know where everything is leading, but I try to have faith and I try to have trust that what's happening is perfect and working in divine order. And that to me is Dharma. So really you can't go wrong and it's okay not to know where you're going. I think that's the real takeaway from this question is it's okay not to know. You're still living your Dharma, especially if you're doing your practice and you have faith and you trust. Okay, how's that? First question in the bag. I think that was pretty good. Okay, second question from Jarrett, my friend, my business partner, past guest on Dharma Talk. Thanks, Jarrett. Okay, his question is, do you think mankind will wake up and avert crisis? Or do you think we are headed towards mass death and destruction via climate change, natural disaster, war, etc.? Okay, this is a good question, and this is we're getting into the heavy stuff now. The honest answer is, I don't know. You know, I, I don't have the answers to this, but I can tell you how I feel about it. I can tell you about my intuition on these sorts of things. And what I'll say is, is this. Science fiction is already here. You know, if you look at movies from even five or 10 years ago, the stuff that they were predicting for the future as being, you know, beyond the reach of our comprehension and our command of technology and the way we manipulate our reality around us was that was impossible then. And now it's here. You know, I, I remember watching The Simpsons like as a little kid and seeing video calling as being a thing in the future. And now we all do that. We pull out our phone and do FaceTime and it's no big deal. It becomes totally normalized. And while that feels like a more trivial example, maybe, what I take away from that is our ability to solve problems as a species is always shocking. And we shouldn't underestimate ourselves. We should never underestimate what we can engineer our way out of. Now, that being said, what I think is really interesting right now, especially when we were talking about climate change and the destruction of the planet, uh, I'll leave the war aside for now, but the climate change question, what's really interesting, although perhaps not surprising, is what's showing a lot of promise 
to solve these problems that are plaguing us is more of a technological regression than advancement. And by that, I mean going back to the natural state of things before human technology um, intervened. And what I'm talking about when I say all this is the concept of regenerative agriculture. If you don't know about regenerative regenerative agriculture, it's definitely something to look up. A really exciting topic. I don't profess to be an expert in this, but basically this is a system of farming that aims to bring ecosystems back into their natural state of balance. And in doing so, um, harness the power of, of soil, of our earth underneath us to sequester carbon and reverse this ongoing trend of accumulation of carbon in our atmosphere, which is, of course, uh, a major factor in climate change. Now, like I said, I don't know a whole lot about the the practicality of putting this into place, but I know that there are a lot of um, exciting things happening. And I've learned about this through listening to people like Riley Engelhart, who started Kiss the Ground, and Zach Bush, who started Farmer's Footprint, both of which have... Um, short documentaries online that you can watch. And I learned about them through Rich Roll Podcast, which is an amazing podcast that I, if you know, you're listening to this podcast, so you clearly like podcasts, check his out if you haven't already. He has a lot of um, thought-provoking conversations around this topic. So definitely suggest checking that out. And ultimately, it's not going to be our technological understanding or intellectual understanding of a non-technological solution, as the case may be, that's going to get us out of this mess. As we all know, an idea is only worth as much as people can get behind it and put the actions in to support it. So what is really promising about this regenerative agriculture idea is, is not so much that it could work in theory. What's exciting about it is that people are excited about it, meaning farming is becoming a field of interest for young people who want to make change. This is something that both Riley and Zach talked about in their interviews as they're getting all these people who feel impassioned to change the world and, and address this problem that the planet, our species is facing. And they're ready to get their hands dirty, both literally and figuratively with farming. So you know, I see that as a possible solution, a possible way out. Educate yourself on that if that's of interest. Look up regenerative agriculture. Look up Kiss the Ground. Look up Farmer's Footprint. And with all that being said, I'll go back to the original question. Do I think mankind is headed toward mass death and destruction? And the answer is, despite our ability to engineer our way out of problems? Yes, I, I do. I mean, I think that inevitably we are headed toward mass death and destruction. And I don't say that to be a pessimist, but to have a broader view, to look, to take the telescope out and, and look at the nature of reality. You know, people talk about how we're destroying the planet and I understand what people mean by that. They're, they're trying to get us to take accountability for our habitat and, and not mess up the world for future generations. But the truth is the planet's going to outlive us. I mean, I really believe that, you know, just like the dinosaurs roam the earth for millions of years and then we're wiped out in an instant, you know, we're going to be a blip too. And to think that we have the ability to destroy nature is, is pretty hubristic, if that's a word. It's pretty arrogant. I, I don't think that's possible. We are destroying ourselves. We are destroying the future of the, our, our children and grandchildren. And we should definitely do something about that. But at the same time, nature is going to course correct and continue through ice ages, desert phases, mass species extinctions, long after our little phase passes, just like it always has in the past. And yeah, eventually the sun will burn out and the earth will be attacked by asteroids and who knows what's going to happen. But nature beyond our scope of understanding is going to continue onward. Okay, that got pretty cosmic at the end of there, but I hope you're satisfied with that answer. Let's move on. Next question comes from at MD Francisco420. 
on Instagram. And he says, how should I battle my alcoholic demons through yoga? Okay, this is a great question and a really important one. This is not, I have not been an alcoholic in, in my life. However, I do believe, and it's been confirmed by many interviews on this show, that yoga is very powerful for combating alcoholism and addiction of other forms as well. Um, just off the top of my head, addiction of some form or another has been addressed by Taylor Hunt, Jeannie Heaton, Deuce Bennett, B.B. Lorenzetti, Danny Pomploon, Dimitri Mugianis. So check out those episodes for really inspiring and heartfelt tales, um, personal histories of using yoga to get through addiction and the challenges, the struggles of that. And no, it's certainly not easy, but these people have gone on the record sharing how powerful yoga was in their healing and continues to be in their healing. I do think that when we get into practicing yoga to overcome an addiction, whether it be alcoholism, whether it be sex, whether it be shopping, um, scrolling on your phone, or eating disorders, whatever, in a sense, we are replacing one addiction for another. And I think that's okay. It's not perfect. It's not a perfect solution to trade in something self-destructive for something that is better for you, like yoga. Certainly it's an improvement, but it's not perfect because you're still attached. And I don't say that to be high and mighty and look down my nose. I believe that I have an addiction to my yoga practice. And I reckon with that. I think about it because yoga teaches us that we want to have no attachments. So would I really be okay if I weren't able to practice yoga? It's a tricky question. You know, um, I did the Vipassana meditation uh, earlier this year and they tell you don't do any yoga. And I was like, I have to do yoga. Like I went into secret spot and did my yoga because I know that the purpose behind the, the policy was not they don't think yoga is um, uh, compatible with the Vipassana method. It's just they don't want you to be a distraction. So I like s snuck off into a secret corner and did like a 10 minute yoga practice every day. But even doing that, I was like, wow, I'm really, really attached to this. So, you know, replacing one addiction for another is not the absolute solution. But what I will say about yoga as a good replacement is that eventually through the practice of yoga, we do get to see ourselves more truthfully. And the source of any addiction as, you know, Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous always teaches is something deeper than the addiction itself. So it's not that the alcoholism is the problem. No, alcoholism is your band-aid solution to a deeper problem that you may or may not be aware of. So by doing yoga, you get closer to the root of that issue. And if you can really see that, you can face it, then maybe, just maybe, you can heal the trauma or heal the source of that addiction from the root. Okay, next question. Next question comes from at yogawoman12 on Instagram. Thanks for the question. Why is yoga so damn good for the mind, body, and soul? Okay, I think that question was a little bit um, a little bit lighthearted and tongue in cheek, but I still want to answer it. I think body is is kind of obvious, but basically, you know, body it's you have the asana practice to do a really comprehensive form of physical exercise. It's cardiovascular. I mean, depending on the type of yoga you're practicing, of course, but it can be cardiovascular. And unlike other forms of exercise, because of all the different arrangements of your body and your anatomy because of the yoga poses, you're really moving through every inch of your tissues. You do the back bends, you do the side bends, forward folds, you do the forward rounding, maybe twisting. And because of that, you are working from the spinal column to send compression and awareness through all of your nervous system. 
So there's like the muscular aspect of it, the fascia, all of that stuff. I'm not going to get hyper technical because it's not my area of expertise. And also, I don't think that's really what counts. What it's about is bringing awareness into your body. And that starts with the nervous system. That's why I think the spine is at the center of the physical asana practice. Mind. Okay. Body and mind are a continuum. Yoga teaches you that. But if we're going to speak explicitly or um, if we're going to speak directly about the mind, then I think the reason why yoga is so good for your mind is that it forces you into a state of focus, doing these precarious balances, staying with the discomfort that you put yourself in a panicky pose, like a, like a deep back bend and being there for it really teaches you concentration and it teaches you how to withstand distress. And then the soul. Well, I think this takes you out of the arena of asana, although asana can get you there too. The reason why it's so good for your soul is yoga teaches you compassion for the other. The yamas and niyamas are all about being good to one another and doing that and understanding why and doing all these psychic development techniques that come from clearing your nervous system, all of that brings you closer to unity consciousness where our ego is no longer the center of our reality, even if it's just for a moment of the day, just in your shavasana, even that is helpful. And this gives your soul relief, or really the roles, the soul is always at peace. So it's better to say it gives the mind the relief of accountability over your identity. When you step behind the mind and the body and you identify with the spirit, then that's good for your soul. That's good for your spirit because it reveals it, it reveals to you that that's who you are. Now, this is a broad question, I think intentionally. So I, I want to focus it a little bit more just to give you something more to chew on. And that aspect of the practice where we reveal the self. This is where we start to get out of the realm of scientific inquiry, scientific explanation, and we get into the sort of ineffable territory. But what I want to share with you is that certain science is getting us a little closer to understanding that. Um, you must check out Eddie Stern's book, One Simple Thing. I had him on the podcast a while back. I really respect Eddie and admire him for his practice and his teaching and um, and also for this book. He talks about, well, first of all, one simple thing is a great kind of primer on yoga philosophy. When you read the beginning, he, he just breaks down the yoga sutras and the core teachings of yoga into plain language that's great for anyone who has more of a logical mind and, or doesn't want to sift through the dense spiritual texts. But when you get to the end, chapter 11 is the one that you need to read because this is where he talks about how the breath and its connection to the autonomic nervous system relates to our understanding of how yoga works on the spirit. So I won't say too much more about that, but I do highly recommend one simple thing. And you can also start with the podcast interview with Eddie. Okay, next question comes from Hargobind. What was your favorite interview thus far? All right. Uh, this question is difficult because whenever you are asked to give your favorite, then it's like, oh, if, if I don't say it, that means I didn't like it. That's not true. I've learned something from every single episode and, you know, I, I am thankful and grateful for each opportunity to have one of these conversations, but I'll do my best to pick out some favorites. Hargobind, I got to give you a shout out. Hargobind, you're one of my favorite interviews so far. Um, partly because you were the first one. And uh, Hargobin, I really appreciate you agreeing to do an interview with me when you didn't know anything about the show. You never heard it before. You just knew me. And basically, it was a favor to me to come on the show. And I also love this interview because I was so nervous to do it. And reflecting back on the experience of interviewing you, going through the process for the first time and figuring it out shows me just how far I've come and how much I've grown in a short period of time and really underscores my gratitude for this podcast. 
So Hargobind, that was definitely one of my favorites. Another favorite would be uh, Veronica, my wife, because it was a gift to be able to share the platform with my partner. And also it was just, it felt really silly at the time to be doing it um, because Veronica and I are, you know, we're basically attached to the hip. She's my wife. We spend all of our time together and we, you know, we move around the world together teaching and we've been through all these ups and downs together with moving and, and all of that. But we couldn't even do the interview face to face because I didn't have a system to record the interviews that way. I had only been doing the interviews virtually. And to this day, I still do most of them that way. But basically we had to, she had to go downstairs in the house. I went upstairs. We were at her sister's house and we had to like separate ourselves off, close the doors so that we could record the interview online. And it was just like so ridiculous. But that was funny, a funny experience to, to remember and reminisce on. Another one that I really liked uh, was Matthew Baldron because he just radiates joy and we were both belly laughing throughout the entire conversation. It was very clear. We were both having a great time and that was that was real. That was authentic and, and it felt good. I would love to see him and, and catch up with him again. Uh, another one on a forest and there may be some recency bias here because that was that was a very recent episode, but I liked that one because she really pushed me to rethink what I consider to fall under my spiritual practice. And I look forward to taking her class soon this year in 2020. That's going to be fun. And then one more favorite, uh, just a little teaser to keep you excited, uh, is I'm not going to reveal who it was, but it's a interview that I had recently and has not yet been released, but I'll give you a hint. And that's that we recorded the podcast in person in New York. He's the most psychic person that I have ever met in my life. And he has a special connection to Dharma talk. I'll say that. Okay, next question. This question comes from Leah on the Google form. Leah says, what advice do you have for new yoga teachers who want to make yoga and wellness their full-time job? All right. You want to make yoga your full-time job? Get ready. Here's what I'll say. You need to be creative and you need to be persistent. I think what a lot of people looking at the yoga industry from the outside, looking at yoga teaching specifically from the outside, fail to acknowledge is just how much innovative thinking and creativity and and discipline need to go into making it work. From the outside, it's like, oh yeah, I want to do that. I want to teach yoga. I want to do yoga all the time. Um, that sounds nice because I love my practice. But on the one hand, yes, it's going to deeply enrich your practice because teaching and sharing and connecting with others is what is one of the things that, that yoga is really about is seeing yourself in the other. You know, I spoke on that earlier. But on the other hand, in a lot of ways, it can really challenge your practice. When you are putting pressure on this thing that's become your spiritual sanctuary, your practice to suddenly pay your bills, then it puts a new kind of stress on there. And you need to be ready for that. Um, not because it's unreconcilable, but because if you're not expecting it, then it could really spoil your practice for you. And that would be a shame. So if you want to be a full-time yoga teacher, I think the first thing is be ready to fully commit to your practice. If you are not committed to your practice, then you really have no place teaching. I don't mean to be harsh, but it just, not, it won't work. Your teaching needs to be coming from a place of conviction and passion. This goes back to Ikigai a little bit. You have to have that fire and true desire to share because the reality is if you're not giving that to the students, then they'll go somewhere else. There are plenty of other yoga teachers who are impassioned about their teaching. And also you have to continue practicing because that's where you are going to get the information that you relay onto your students. And sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes you're teaching multiple classes a day, maybe 
you know, if you're, if you're starting out, that's what you got to do. Multiple classes a day. It's like, where am I going to fit in my practice? That's got to be priority number one. Never forget that. Your practice must come first. I don't necessarily mean chronologically. Maybe you teach an early morning class and then you practice later. That's fine. But priority wise, do not give up your practice no matter what. Now, the other thing that you need to know if you want to make yoga your full-time work is it's a business. Yoga teaching makes you an entrepreneur. Maybe you're very lucky and there's a place that will hire you as a full-time employee, but that's extremely rare. I don't, I don't know of a place that does that, but you know, you're creative. That's part of the, the job responsibility too. So maybe you can find that great. But for most people, you're going to be an entrepreneur of some kind or a freelancer or an independent contractor. And as an entrepreneur, freelancer, independent contractor, you have to wear a lot of hats. You might think in the beginning, you just get to be a spiritual teacher or a fitness instructor or some combination thereof. But the reality is you're that and you're also marketer, agent, copywriter, accountant, the list goes on, and you need to embrace all aspects of the job. Maybe later on, you hire people, hire a team to help you, but especially in the beginning, certainly in the beginning, you gotta be willing to do everything because all of it leads back to your mission. If you lose the fervor, if you lose the discipline or the drive to do all those things that don't really um, don't really stir up your drive on their own, then you have to remember why it is that you're doing that. Like, yeah, when you're doing your taxes, it's like, well, I'm doing this so that I can continue making money so that I can support this lifestyle and I don't have to go back to my other job. Or why am I doing the Instagram posts every day? It's not just to get likes. It's not just to get new followers. What's the point of all of that? Those are vanity metrics. The purpose you know, for me, maybe, maybe it's different for you, but it's to gain more exposure so that it creates more opportunities to do what it is that matters, to share the yoga in person at a level that people can really absorb. So if you can understand what your purpose is, then it'll help you stay motivated with all these other ancillary, anc ancillary tasks of the job at hand. Now, when you treat your yoga teaching like a business, the other thing you have to do is learn to embrace money. I spoke on this earlier, and I think that there is this idea in the spiritual community, in, in the yoga world, that we're supposed to shy away from money because anything that's spiritual shouldn't have finances attached to it. But we just have to get over that because if you really, if you think of, if you think about money that way, no money is going to come in and then you got to give up. Like we all need money to survive unless you've worked out a situation where you go to the monastery and you're exchanging, you're fi you find another system of exchange. You don't need currency because you just do a little work around the monastery and they feed you and you live in, you're living a money-free lifestyle. Okay, that's a different situation and great. If you, that's for you, awesome. But if you want to have a family and you want to have an otherwise, you know, conventional life, meanwhile, running your own business, teaching yoga then you need to be okay with making money. And the way to be okay with making money is realize that it's not something evil. Just like anything else, it's how you use it. Money is, is void of positive or negative value. It's just a system of exchange, and it's a way that we got away from bartering so we don't have to exchange one physical good or service for another. It's a token so that you can go get more services. Okay, so if you want to be a householder in a capitalist system, you need to make money, and you need to be okay with that. So let's talk about how you can structure a business teaching yoga quickly. I think this is true for basically any business. You need to have entry points that are low cost or even free, and then you gradually ascend people up a value ladder. So at the very beginning, at the very bottom of the ladder, the cost is low or free. That also means the commitment of your students, clients, customers is also low. And the value has also got to be low to match it. So for that, it might be something like teaching little uh, tips and tricks on Instagram or having a YouTube channel that's for free or offering a podcast. Look at that. Low cost would be something like your group classes. It's very difficult to make a living as a yoga teacher just teaching group classes because it's a low cost product. 
It's a low cost service. However, it's also very important because as you ascend people up the value ladder, they gain more trust in you and no one's going to just jump. Well, very few people are going to jump straight from nothing to buying the most expensive service from you. But if they ascend your value ladder with you, then they gain the trust and then they want to go deeper and learn more from you and you can give them more value. The next level up might be something like workshops, a medium cost thing. Maybe above that, a retreat or an immersion, like a five-day immersion. You can charge more for these things because you're providing more value, but you're also asking more of a commitment from the students. So you work them up the ladder. And finally, it might, you know, at the highest level, it might be something like a teacher training. On top of all of these aspects, all of these um, tiers on the value ladder, it's also great to have recurring revenue or passive income. The way to do this is, you know, I've, I've recently launched Henry Yoga App. And at this point, it's not making me any money because we put a lot of capital into developing it. So it's not profitable yet. And I'm fine saying that. I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm giving too much away. But eventually, you know, we're, the idea here is that money can come in and I'm no longer exchanging time for money. I will always continue. Well, I can't say always, but as of now, I want to keep offering live classes. I get a lot of joy and energy out of teaching yoga classes. But to take the financial pressure off of that can only open up more possibilities for me to do pro bono classes and, and donate my time to charity and, and all of this and just not have to be concerned with money so much. So for these recurring revenue systems, basically what you're doing is you're setting up systems to make you money in the background. And you don't need to create an online program to do that. There are other ways to do it. You could get into affiliate marketing, um, selling other people's products and services. You know, you see people do this on Instagram all the time with the, the discount codes and, and whatnot. So I think what's important is that you structure your yoga teaching. If you want to go full-time as a business, be be willing to embrace that that's part of the job. It's not just, I'm a yoga teacher. I get to spout spiritual knowledge. It's also a business. Now, with all that being said, what I will say on top of all of that advice, which I still stand behind, is it's okay for you to teach yoga on the side, okay? Perpetually or for a temporary period of time. I don't, I'm not really a big believer in jumping out of the, the plane and building the parachute on the way down because of the added pressure. Like now you're going to figure it out. I'm sure that works for some people, but for me, I'd rather have a calculated approach. So find a way, don't feel bad about finding a way to support yourself financially in the meantime, while you build up your yoga business, there's nothing wrong with that. And it will make your peace of mind much more attainable. Okay, I think that's going to cover it for this one. Thank you all again for submitting questions. This has been fun and different and uh, a growth exercise for me to just be on this side of the mic without an interviewer and or without an interviewee for that matter. So thank you again. And if you enjoyed this format for the show, let me know, you know, tag it on Instagram, send me an email. If it's popular, we'll do it again. If not, no hard feelings. We'll stick to what works. So have a beautiful start to your 2020. I'm so excited to dive into this year with you. We've got a lot of exciting podcast episodes on the horizon. It's only going to get better from here. So thank you and speak to you next week. Dharma Talkers, I hope you enjoyed listening to that conversation as much as I enjoyed having it. And if you did, please share it. Take a screenshot, share it on Instagram, and tag me at Henry Wins. I love hearing from you about the conversations that make an impact for you. We have the ability to shape the world through our thoughts, words, and conversation. So let's influence the collective consciousness together. All my gratitude to Rory Wagstaff of Ease of Mind Productions for keeping our audio crisp and operations smooth and to Patrick Kiebzak of Momentology Music and Art for supplying the powerful soundtrack to these conversations. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review, and tune in to new episodes of Dharma Talk every Thursday. I'll speak to you next week, and until then, keep living your dharma.